Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back Thomas L. Friedman and Dove Seidman. Thanks, everybody. I hope you, you got a chance to have a break and um, are enjoying the day. I, um, I, I certainly am learning a lot. Um, anyone who reads my column knows that one of the people I quote most often is my friend of Dove Seidman. And um, you can read his bio in, in, in your book. And over the years, Dove and I have done a lot of events uh, together. And last year at the Davos World Economic Forum, we, we, uh, we did an, an event with the three tech giants. I mean, the CEOs of three giant tech companies. And um, one of them began, actually, it's sort of interesting. He began by holding up, he had a Fitbit, wasn't it, a Fitbit thing on his wrist. And he was um, complimenting one of the other tech titans there for um, kind of his humanity, for having called him and said, um, I noticed um, you aren't walking so much. I follow you on Fitbit. And um, uh, are, are you OK, he said. And um, I was sitting on one end, and Dove was sitting on the other. And <laughs> Dove sort of winked at me. And, um, what was that wink saying, though? <laughs> well, the tech titan who I admire uh, lives here and held up his Fitbit and was saying, this is changing the world. My dentist knows if I'm brushing my teeth. My friends call me when I'm not moving to check on me. That's why technology is amazing. And I thought about it, and I, something didn't feel right. And I said, you know, what about the 30 friends who didn't pick up the phone who share that data? I think that the person who picked up the phone and called you your friend learned something in his bar mitzvah, was properly educated, and was animated by an ethos of humanity and friendship, and he called you because he's a good friend. And the Fitbit and the data and the technology created the possibility of a connection, but if you want a deep, meaningful, rich, enduring human connection, there's got to be a value in someone's heart that makes somebody pick up the phone. And until we fuse technology and humanity, we're not going to have the human progress. And that there's no Moore's law for human progress. Moore's law is unabating, it's relentless, it's linear. Human progress is fits and starts. And it was Einstein who said that, I fear the day, and I was listening to Andrew this morning, and it was just so compelling, but it also evoked Einstein for me. I fear the day when technology surpasses human interaction, we will then have a world of idiots. And it's a reminder to us that humanity has to some, come together with technology. So what did you think when I told the Jamba Juice story then? Yeah. A company that divides its workday up into 15-minute increments and um, rewards people and is plugged into the Weather Channel? What, 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 did, what, did, that, what did that strike you? <clears throat> Listen, the story is a microcosm of new dynamics. People are trying to get customers into a store, and they will and ought to use that, that data. At the same time, we could probably ask Jeff Wiener later today, I believe that employee is likely on LinkedIn looking for a job. Because for too many sunshines where he's called in to work, he's probably telling his wife or his loved ones, you know, they ruined another day of my life, and it's time to find another job. We can't just treat people like employees. He's a human being with plans and hopes and aspirations. And if we don't humanize our enterprises uh, and yank people into work just because data says we need another body, uh, I think we're missing it uh, in that way. You know, this whole notion of machines replacing jobs, if we step back, we should remind ourselves that in the first place, we gave humans and people jobs that machines could have done in the first place. Asking you would be on a Ford assembly line, and Henry Ford, even though he was socially animated, he wanted people to afford his car. He also said that employees don't like to think, they like to be told what to do. And asking an employee to show up and be repetitive, do the same thing over and over and over again, work longer, not shorter, take fewer breaks, and be a quasi-robot, in itself is part of the problem because we've scaled institutions and companies that have treated people as workers who do the same thing over and over again. Machines are getting rid of those jobs. And I say, great, let's forfeit to them. I declare victory. Machines won. And now we have an amazing opportunity to give humans the chance to do what we do best. We feel things. 
Only human beings have a sense of consciousness and conscience to understand the implications of our behavior, to relate to another human being the way Einstein wanted us to, uh, and also have a conscience to know when we deviate from what's right uh, and feel it and come back to what's right when we deviate. So, you know, you, your, your thesis um, is contained in a, in a book called How. Yeah. Um, and you, you, you turned How into a, pra a trademark. You, you, basically a book that says it's great that we're all getting connected, we're all hyper-connected now, but we're actually in the age of behavior, you say, where how you live your life how you say you're sorry or don't say you're sorry, mm -hmm. how you interact with your employees, your citizens, your readers, matters more than ever. What, what, what do you mean by that thesis? Well, our grandparents, when they, when they put us on their knees, told us behavior matters. The thesis is that the world has gone from connected to interconnected to hyperconnected to interdependent. We've never lived in a time where we rise and fall together. You've written about the one vegetable vendor in Tunisia that with a few friends and cell phone cameras did in fact spark a revolution towards freedom throughout the entire Middle East. We see a mid-level banker in London lose $2 billion clicking away at his desk and increasing volatility in markets. We see example after example of one tweet creating a social or consumer protest against a country or company that makes them reverse course. Never have we lived in a time where the behavior of any one person can affect so many others so far away in ways it could not before. And never more have we lived in a world where I, as your employee, can see inside you, my boss, and tell the world about it without an editor, a libel lawyer, Absolutely. or any kind of filter. So well, your house matters so much more. Well, as human beings, we have a canny trait. We care about what we can see. If you can look inside and see how the sausage is made, you care about what's being put in the sausage. Uh, McDonald's used to say, we're a great company. Billions of people served here. Now we can look inside. We're having a conversation with McDonald's about trans fats and childhood obesity. When the walls come down, we see inside. Boardrooms, shop floor, actually into the attitudes and character of people, even into private conversations in their homes, and we can tell everybody about it. But my real thesis is that competitive advantage has shifted to behavior. The ability to create value has shifted to behavior. And when I mean by behavior, Collaboration is a behavior, even though we call it collaboration. Mm -hmm. Innovation is a behavior. Creativity, imagination, to post, to tweet, to write a thoughtful email as opposed to a disrespectful one. All the ways in which we communicate, manifest who we are, work with others, go to market, say things, keep promises or not, it's all behavior. And I think that that's the last frontier. We've pretty much commoditized everything else and machines are gonna keep that going. So what does it mean for a CEO today? And what does it mean for an employee? CEOs, uh, in my view, used to be in the answer business. An answer business? Answer business. A few of them said, here's where we're taking this company. And everybody else, we got to get them to follow, to obey. And if they were more autocratic, to blindly obey. Uh, you know, labor didn't trust management. And management didn't trust labor. We know where we're going. We'll chop up jobs into small itsy bitsy pieces, give a man a job, a task, and that's how we're gonna go. <clears throat> CEOs today, in a world in which they want all their people to go on Facebook and defend the company when they're attacked, to collaborate, the more humanity we ask from employees, the more we ask from employees, the more we can't get it from them with carrots and sticks. Uh, so CEOs today are now, are now not giving answers, they're creating corporate cultures, context, environments, ecosystems, where they're, they're so full of meaning, so full of a sense of what the mission is, what is right, what the values are, because we now need everybody to think, everybody to know what the right thing to do is, everybody to pop out of their seat uh, and do the right thing. Unfortunately, seven out of 10 employees are not engaged on the job today. Uh, that's $500 billion in lost productivity. We have a painful jobs crisis, but I call this a careers crisis where so many people who are collecting a paycheck are leaning out and not leaning in. They're not creating jobs for their brothers and sisters and cousins. Two out of those seven are sabotaging their company. They're actually online saying some pretty nasty things. I consider that leadership malpractice. So many people in power who are paying people, but they can't enlist them in journeys worthy of their dedication. So you have to lead in a different way. When you, when, I know that so many CEOs call you almost like an, an emergency. Dove, I got a crisis. Yeah. 
And your answer is, well, you've got to lead in a different way. What is that new way? Well, I don't think you can get anything done in this world without power and authority. You can't. But moral authority, do this because I'm your boss, whether you say it or imply it, or do this because you know I'm going to be filling out your performance evaluation at the end of the year. We now live in a world where formal authority is decaying. Uh, the interconnected world, while wealth and capital is still concentrated, power is distributed, it's democratized. And you add transparency to that, we're in uncharted territory. People still have some levers of power, but others have been distributed. So formal authority is giving way to moral authority. I mean, Nelson Mandela may rest in peace on his hospital bed and his pinky had moral, more moral authority than most people in power will ever have. The idea is you still need to get somebody to do something, but if you don't tell them why, if you don't enlist them in its rightness, in its value, uh, they'll go someplace else. I mean, when the internet started, we had about 6,000 protests, recorded protests. Last year, we had 250,000, give or take, protests. The ability of somebody to resist and cast off autocratic, top-down leadership. Uh, you said you had to lead through people now, not so much over people. There's but no power over people. It's power through people. Uh, let me tell you a story about a leader that I admire more than anybody else, perhaps, uh, up there. She's 11 years old today. Uh, her name is Martha Payne. When she was nine, she's a Scottish schoolgirl. She didn't like the food in her school. She convinced her father to let her take photographs of it and blog about it. So what do you think the school board did? Formal authority. They went to the, uh, the school went to the school board and they shut her down. So Jamie Oliver, the famous chef, and a million other people started supporting her blog. They have reversed their policy. They're now serving gourmet food, which is an oxymoron in that part of the world. Uh, it's nutritious. Children all over the world are doing the same thing, and they've raised extra funds for malnutrition kids in Malawi. And if you go onto her blog, it says, I am a future workforce leader. A nine-year-old can force somebody in power to have a two-way conversation. So no more one-way conversations. It's completely over. Everything is a two-way conversation. When Netflix decided that they are so powerful because they were adding subscribers faster than others could count, they did a little itsy-bitsy price increase. 800,000 consumers within 48 hours bolted. When have you, when's the last time we saw 800,000 people engage in collective action? And, and I credit Reed, uh, Reed uh, Hastings, their CEO. He paused and he said, OK, we were counting subscribers, but we weren't measuring how loyal, how deep is the human glue in the connection. Uh, we were being arrogant in our behavior. Let's be more humble. And they went on a journey to start to rectify. Because in the interconnected world, you make more mistakes. And how you come back from mistakes is part of how you build value. Is it an authentic apology or not? And uh, they've been winning Emmys, and they're soaring again because they figured out how to do it. So you just mentioned a word that almost every day now you pick up the newspaper, and somebody is, an, is apologizing. Yeah. It's like, we need news, weather, sports, apologies. You know? yeah. And um, uh, yeah. somebody was apologizing for something they tweeted, they blogged, they said. Are, are we in an apology epidemic? You know, Elton John said, a, a sorry seems to be the hardest word. It's now the easiest word. Uh, mm. You know, we, we, I caught myself the other day. We tell a child to apologize. Uh, we say, say you're sorry. We're teaching a verbal escape route. Just say it. And every day by noon, I'm watching powerful people in a press conference, and we're judging. How did he say it? Was that authentic? So I actually wrote something in the New York Times. I called for an apology ceasefire, because we're teaching people that an apology is a way to get out of something when you're supposed to get into a process of, and there's five steps of an authentic apology, where how did I drift from who I am? Where, what is my plan to make amends? Uh, do I mean it? Is it therapeutically painful? Do I really feel a pain that I've let somebody down? Well, am I prepared to engage the person that I've aggrieved and give them a chance to give me feedback as to how I can make it up to them? And finally, if you don't commit yourself to a course of behavioral change. But in this instantaneous world, we're just teaching people to say you're sorry. Uh, and the confirmation bias takes off. If you think the person's a putz, you say, I don't believe the apology. And if you <laughs> love the person, you say, I believe the apology. Uh, so I think we've got to pause and just understand that in this world, we've got to start doing deep things and not just say it. So I called for an apology ceasefire. And now in the New York Times, we're crowdsourcing. And we put up apologies, and we ask readers to rate them, and Fitbit actually, uh, uh, Fitbit actually, the CEO Parker of Fitbit, they were, they were skin rashes. 
and we allowed readers to rate the authenticity of that apology as we supplied data as to all the things they did. He, he wrote handwritten notes, he apologized in a certain way, and they came out with high scores for an authentic apology. So that's my small contribution <laughs> to putting some scrutiny on this issue. So Del, if I was flying out here, I, <laughs> I, I read a piece about you in I think it was Sports Illustrated uh, online that the NFL has engaged you. You spoke to all the team owners and uh, general managers and some of the coaches, and all the coaches, I believe. Um, how did a, a, a nice guy like you get involved with the NFL? Well, you know, uh, we think that the NFL is uh, somehow in the past, but the NFL is one of the greatest capitalistic achievements ever. Now, leadership is about trend lines, not reading the headlines. Their headlines, give or take, are pretty amazing. Other people are disengaged. They have more fan loyalty engagement than ever. The red zone, outside of the iPhone, is probably the greatest innovation and invention you can imagine. I mean, so they launched the channel, and people can't stop watching it. But the NFL is a metaphor for everything we're talking about, I think, here today. Hmm. We come to work every day with a sense of hope that anything is possible because of something we watched on Sunday. The language, Monday morning quarterback, call a timeout, call an audible, hail Mary, let's block and tackle. The NFL has entered our consciousness. It's Sunday religion. 45% of viewers are actually women. Uh, and they're dealing with all the issues we're dealing with. One is there's disruption. The home experience is so amazing because of machines and technology that how do they get people to the stadiums? Hmm. When people are in the stadiums, how do you ensure that a father is not going to hear profanity and bring his son back? When people are in the stadiums, they don't want to be in the seats. They want a special room to have a social uh, experience. And they're starting to think of things, and then they, they have a Jackie Robinson moment. The first openly gay player comes out. Science is saying, what about concussions? Should we let our kids play? We have a president that says, not sure I would let my kids play. What if three presidents say that in a row? Mm. And then you have the bullying thing. And what's interesting, everybody thinks the bullying thing between Richie Incogn Incognito and Martin happened in the locker room. It was all on text and tweet. The locker room is no longer locked. It's wide open. So the NFL is trying to get ahead of this, and I admire them for doing that. They're saying, if the locker room is a metaphor for where we show up and how we work and how we communicate, let's start to have a conversation. And instead of rules and policies and control, let's start to have a conversation about respect. Let's start to have a conversation about corporate culture. And what's interesting is they're all about winning. So they don't want to do this to avoid bad press and stay out of jail. They believe that if they do this right, they win. And one way to underscore this, the last seven Super Bowls have been won with a head coach that's considered a player's coach. He doesn't even see them as players. They're human beings, as fathers and husbands. As he, opposed to a shouter or a screamer. Or, or an X and an O. Mm -hmm. so the, and they don't scream. Tony Dungy wrote a book, Quiet Strength. They visit them at, at home when they have life events, like a birth of a son or a daughter. And there hasn't been a victory in professional sports Football, soccer, you can't name a professional sports where an old school dictatorial command and control coach has eked out victory. World Cup starts today. I'm making a prediction. Mm. Whoever wins it will be won by a more humanist, humanitarian coach. So you know, before we go to questions, um, one of the favorite columns I did with, with, uh, with you and, and um, that, that got a reaction was after Nelson Mandela died, there was something about, there was just a sense of, I think in the world, certainly in this country, that we not only lost a great man who did great things for South Africa with, um, uh, with President de Klerk, by the way, but that it was almost a morning of leadership, that, that yeah. we're not going to see not just the likes of this man, but this kind of leadership. And there's an image you used in that piece, which I really like, which describes um, what so much of politics is about today, yeah. which is all about shifting. She's shifting Republicans here. That was Obama's last campaign, you know, using big data to shift a number of these yeah. people in this zip code to here, and, and not about elevating. Yeah. So talk about that. What, was, what did Mandela's death and the vacuum it, it, it felt like in yeah. the left field? You know, I, I looked it up. You know that today is the 50-year anniversary of the day he was sent to jail for the rest of his life, hmm. today as we sit here. It's extraordinary. Well, he had the benefit that most of us don't have. He had a long pause in his life. What do you mean by that? He had pause. Look at Martin Luther King, letter from Birmingham jail. Some of the greatest leadership came from people who were in jail or had to stop and say, what do I believe? What are my values? So Mandela first had a philosophy as to how to be in the world. And he 
understood that if you want people to be inspired, you can't use carrots and sticks. Uh, you know, I wheel my suitcase. It took 20 years for the suitcase companies to get us to wheel our suitcases and not carry them because of attitudes. Men said only women would be caught dead in an airport, uh, you know, wheeling their suitcases. Mm -hmm. Real men carry theirs. If we don't change mindsets, we're not going to change behavior. The marketplace is great at using carrots and sticks. If you put a product on sale, you buy more, not less, now, not later, a political attack ad, vote left, right, 30 seconds later. Collaboration, imagination, commitment, dedication, loyalty, the resilience, all the qualities that we want from people, you can't shift for. You could triple people's salary. You could tell people, go in the room and do not emerge unless you two figure out how to collaborate and you're from different cultures and you're not going to get collaboration. You could triple people's salaries and you're not going to get accountability and authenticity and transparency. So what Mandela understood is that to elevate people, not the, just shift them. Not just shift them side to side, forward, back. The only thing that has ever elevated another human being is a mission worthy of their loyalty, a purpose that implicates who they think they are in their sense of dignity and honor, values of fairness and honesty that allow people to lean in, trusting people with the truth. They got to have it. Trusting people with the truth. That's not something you see in America these well, days. Well, we provide the truth. We give the truth. Trusting people with the truth already shows them respect that they can handle it. And finally, not seeing people as cogs and part, they're not there as part of your execution plans. You got to give them a journey. But the, he also made himself, he did big things by making himself small. He had humility. He, he said, I am not the hope. Don't see me as the hope. My leadership challenge is to inspire hope in others. And when I listened to the morning, there was a part of me that was feeling, here's the answer. Machines do not have the ability to inspire hope in people. When FDR said, you have nothing to fear but fear itself, that was an elegant double negative way of saying don't lose hope. When people do not have hope, they don't have answers, they don't have a path, they lean out. And I think this morning's conversation has the merits and virtue of it being true. But now we need to create a sense of hope, a path forward. And to me, the path forward is a certain kind of leadership animated by moral and not formal authority, power through people, not power over, people who truly seek to elevate people, not just shift them, as instruments of some grand plan. And we got to put people on a journey worthy of them. And here we are in San Francisco, and this is the place that invented the pivot. And what do you do on a journey? You pivot. But if you think of a pivot, it's you don't tack, you pivot. And a pivot means one foot on the ground, some a belief, learnings, commitments, convictions, your values. And then you figure out that the world is going in new directions, and you pivot in that direction. And I think you would all agree that life is a journey. And the reason I think life is a journey is it's curvilinear. It goes up and down. Our health goes up and down. Our marriages, our friendships, they go up and down. But the business world has said no journeying here. Everything has to be linear. For the next five years, profits are going to go like this, revenue like this. And when you try to superimpose through planning and control and analytics, linearity in a curvilinear world, you start to create all sorts of games and, and detachment. And if life and business are merging, then business and leadership have to be about journeys and not plans and implementation. And taking people on journeys. Taking, inspiring people. Yeah. Uh, you can't coerce or motivate. You have to inspire uh, journeys. We have time for a couple questions for Dove. Um, uh, if people want to come, uh, come up to the microphone, it's, um, you know, while people are coming up, Dove, what does all this mean for education? Education has been so much part of our dialogue this morning. There are amazing experts before uh, and after. And um, I loved uh, the comment before that you could, in class, you can't tell a famous professor, can you say that again? Yeah. Uh, this ability to customize and personalize is part of it. But I think the future is about the following in education. I think we're going to bring Aristotle and Heraclitus back to life. Heraclitus said that character is your fate. If we're in the era of behavior, then character determines your destiny. And Aristotle said that excellence is not a single act, but a habit. You have to cultivate virtues through lots of going to the right gym. And I think we're going to see a marriage of new soft skills, elevated skills, collaboration, imagination, creativity, leadership, not time management and active listening mm. and interpersonal, true so the true soft skills are consciousness, empathy, the ability to feel things, to relate, to lead, to work with others from other places. So those are the new soft skills. And they're going to have to be married to character. 
values like integrity and truth. And when you have character animating those skills, I think you're unstoppable in this world. And I think education needs to go back to that which develops character, philosophy, the great works. Where else? It's the great works that teach you some empathy and how to extend sympathies to others. Um, and we're going to still need to get people in social environments where they learn these skills. And then we need scientists and engineers to poets and philosophers and scientists and engineers have to come together. So, you know, I'm going to go to the question in one split second, but just remind me, because um, we just had a real world interesting example of uh, this kind of leadership and inspiration and values. Donald Sterling, guy mm. who owns the Los Angeles Clippers, um, you know, um, makes racist comments in private, they, they get yeah. public. Adam Silvers, the NBA commissioner, has yeah. been uh, anointed, you know, for the way he handled this. What was your take on it? It's complicated. You know, we need to pause and think deeply about these things. Look, another microcosm. The result is right. Attitude, there's no place for these attitudes. None. He had to go. And I, and I want to be on record saying those attitudes are abhorrent. At the same time, what was the conduct? He was in his house in a vulnerable moment having a difficult interaction with his girlfriend. And he said things. Uh, he did something in his home. We as Americans love privacy. And we love and we protect property. In the end of the day, his property is being taken away from him for something he said in his home. Uh, and even though it's the right outcome, because it's also the outcome the players wanted, there was going to be a tsunami on social media, etc. I wish Magic Johnson, who I am a Laker fan and I admire, did not say I will never step foot in Staples again. I wish he invited Mr. Sterling to the front, to center court, and said, let's have a discussion about race in this league. And I, and I wish the commissioner, instead of just handling this one incident and this one individual, said, this, I'm new to this, compels me to go deep and have a real conversation around the league and its relationship to society. Not just think we dealt with racism because we've evicted this guy. Exactly. And just have a real conversation yeah. and take us on a journey to be better. Yeah. And if this catalyzes that, then it had to happen. I, I'm, I'm on record. When I heard it, I was mortified, had to go. But let's think more deeply about it. And we don't pause enough to go, to go deep. deep. Please, please introduce yourself. Hello, my name's Laura from the University of California, Merced. Hi. And I'm a student. Um, and I really liked what you said about how when we have a conversation, we all benefit and we can change things. Um, I think a lot of people are probably fearful of bringing up those issues. And um, I was wondering how we might be able to change that culture of fear. Yeah. Facilitate conversations like yes. that. Yes. And um, I know Good. you've said a lot about how no one ever washes a rented car. Yes. So <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if maybe if there was an ownership where they felt comfortable and it was their right to uh, better the economy or their jobs or whatever yeah. it might be, um, how do you That's think good. we should start that? Thank you. There's only one uh, legally performance enhancing, all the sports is making me think of performance enhancing drugs. There's actually one legal performance enhancing drug invented, it's called trust. Uh, neuroscientists have proven that when you feel trust, oxytocin is released in your brain. Whatever makes you scared to say something or lean in subsides. Right now, we've measured this, we've looked at 2 million observations, and only 11% of organizations is trust high. We keep having innovation programs, speaking up programs, share your ideas, uh, give ideas as to how to make customers happy, and they all hit walls because there's not enough trust in the room to get people to, to speak. Every time somebody says something, they're taking the risk that somebody above them is going to think they're a bozo, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And if instead of working on the issue, the leaders have to work on the environment. If they can put enough trust in the school, the classroom, the team, the company, people will unleash themselves. Um, and that's, to me, I call it going on a trip. If you want progress, you need innovation, because all innovation en enables progress. But there's no innovation without risk taking. Speaking up is a risk. Investing money without getting return is a risk. And so far, I've spelled a rip, rest in peace. Risk, innovation, mm -hmm. progress. But if you add a T to it, trust, and you create a trip, and you really, and leaders create environments of trust, people really, We'll let you have it. We unfortunately are, are out of time, but I want to, and I'm sorry for the yeah. question, Dove will be around after. So yeah. Dove, just to conclude, you and I uh, did another event once in Davos where you began talking to a room of 
uh, 30, 40 CEOs from all over the world. Yeah. And you took a poll. Yeah. Let me get into your conversation here with that, with that poll that you took of those uh, global Fortune 500, Fortune 100 CEOs, and what was the lesson you took away from it? Tell people what happened. So it was behind closed doors. It was a, a governor's meeting of the people who together relate to billions of people because they're the consumer industry. So they're the ones who are attached to society. And I said to them, how many of you have sophisticated performance enhancing systems that you could get your BlackBerry or iPhone and get a hold of your worldwide head of HR and produce a list of your top 25 performers? And everybody raised their hand. That's easy. We know how to measure performance. And then I said, second question, how many of you with the same confidence and alacrity can produce a list of your top 25 ethical leaders? The ones who are creating the trust in the company, the ones who live the company values. If you get hit by a bus, unfortunately, can take over, etc. And Tom, because it was behind closed doors, every hand came down and they looked at each other and they had a collective epiphany. So then we asked a third question. How many of you, not me, believe that you would be running a better company if your answer to the second question were as good as the first? And every hand went back up. And then we said, how many of you believe that Tom Friedman's flat, hyper-connected, hyper-transparent world is a pretty good time to go get that answer and stick it in your DNA and go forward? And they all raised their hands. And how many of you believe that there was a trick to the question? It's uh, you know, that your ethical leaders and your top performers should probably be the same because you don't want principles and performance for principled performance. And I think what I learned in that moment is even CEOs realize that they're in a new world that's been totally disrupted and we have to cut them some slack. Nobody, when it comes time to really animate and inspire human progress, we all don't have the perfect answers. And they admitted that, and I thought that was a humble moment, and I think they'll be better for it. Duff, thank you very much. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.